did you think some of the teams that played in the bubble, especially the teams that the, 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 the bottom of the 24, do you think that they were like, the, I thought the Rangers were flat when they played in against Carolina. Do you think yeah. that some of these teams were, were flat going in? Cause I expected better out of the bottom teams. They had something to prove. So what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I think for a lot of the teams, it was hard to manufacture. You know, I, I spent some time with, with Craig Berube, head coach Craig Berube of the St. Louis Blues, last year's Stanley Cup champs, and uh, and his lovely uh, partner, Danielle. We had a great talk in, in New York City probably about two months ago. We spent some time together there. And I will say this. I mean, Chief, as he's known as Craig Berube, Chief said, he goes, hey, it was hard for us to get our guys wound up. He goes, we see, I'm not going to lie to you, like our guys – they found it hard to manufacture that juice and a guy like Jordan Bennington, who had such an amazing rookie season and a great season this past year too, by the way, he's an NHL all-star, but he's the guy that feeds off the crowd. A lot of guys feed off the crowd. I mean, you know, it was basically like they were playing in a sense uh, without having our great passionate NHL fans in the building. You know, you miss the oohs and ahs. Uh, there's nothing like play. I'm getting goosebumps here in our, in our living room talk, family room talking about it. You kidding me? There's nothing like the oohs and ahs. Of, a, of an NHL game, let alone a Stanley Cup playoff game, that excitement, you know, the way our fans are are, uh, are so demonstrative and so enthusiastic. And it seems like they, the fans live and die with every play and the pressure. There's nothing in the world, with all due respect to all my sports that I love, there's nothing like the NHL Stanley Cup playoffs. So, yeah, man, to your point, uh, I heard that from St. Louis. I heard it from, from guys and other teams where they said it was tough for them to manufacture. Boston Bruins are another one of those teams. You just asked me, Boston was a top feeder. They were number one team in the East, number one team in the league. They couldn't regain their, their swag. St. Louis, number one team in the West. They couldn't regain their swag. So, and even for some of the teams, like even for uh, Arizona, I know Rick Tockett told me the same thing, that it was tough to have some of their guys, get some of his guys going. And, you know, after they ended up getting in and, uh, and then once they got in the playoffs, it just, it was different for them. They were a different team. And so, too, were a lot of teams. So it was a unique year. Hopefully, we don't have to replicate the bubble scenario anymore, Ash. Hopefully, listen, I always say, I'm going to respect the science and everything else. But in respecting the science, if we can go to the grocery store, you can't tell me you can't go to an arena. Let's be honest. Or oh, 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 right? oh, having protests. Science is science. Or oh, having right? protests. Or oh, having you know protests. And I'm saying to do that in a way that's safe and to do that in a way where you prioritize the safety of all of us and all of our great fans and, you know, all the arena workers and staff. But again, if you and I can go to Stop and Shop, uh, you know, or we can go to Fairway in the city, uh, you know, we can go and get groceries with a mask on. There's no, there's no reason why you can't go to MetLife Stadium just up the street from us here in Jersey, or you can't go to Madison Square Garden safely and, uh, and respectively with health being first. So uh, I'd like to see that continue to be the trend as we go forward. You forgot a place you played in the Prudential Center. Exactly. The Pru <laughs> we live, we're literally right. Our, our Jersey place is literally right in between the Prue and the Garden. We're like smack dab in between the two of them. It's 15 right. minutes either way. Now you retired in 2008, 2009. You had 800, yeah. uh, 848 uh, games, 105, 163, and 33. A 288 yeah. eight goals against, a 903 save percentage. Not bad, not shabby. How Thank do you, you think goaltending has changed from the time you retired till now? Well, I think one of the things that's that's been really cool with the evolution of our position is we've, you know, it goes through different ebbs and flows. One thing that's changed is it became it started to become really super structured in terms of technically speaking. And I feel now it's kind of gotten a balance between structured and athletic. And athletic was back. So, you know, Jonathan Quick is a guy, to me, that's this modern day Mike Richter. And, and Quickie told me Mike Richter was his favorite goalie growing up. Keep in mind, Jonathan Quick is from Connecticut. And he grew up a Ranger fan. So the great Mike Richter had a huge impact on him. And you can see it when he plays. You see how explosive he is. You see how dynamic he is. So it's nice to see that athleticism that's back. Uh, also, if you look at a guy like, for example, Vasilevsky, we were talking about that earlier. He's a big, powerful athlete goalie. Like, he, he wears 88. We know the great 88, my man, the big E, Eric Lindros, Hall of Famer. But he wears his number in the net, and he's almost as big and powerful as the big E was as a power forward center. So it's kind of weird to see that evolution, and we're seeing that in a goalie form. Uh, yes. But you also you also have uh, the the technical kind of wizardry of Carey Price, where he's technically perfect, and then you have another young version of him in Carter Hart down the turnpike with the Philadelphia Flyers, who's an absolute ace already at 20, 21 years old. 
playing in the NHL and going head to head with every top goalie in the league. So what I've in, in totality, we've come to see now goalies that are now both technical and athletic. And because of the way that the game's played and all the movement and the defenseman getting up in the attack offensively, like a Brian Leach, like a Rob Blake in years gone by, now we have Kale McCarr jumping. Now you've got Quinn Hughes jumping. You have John Carlson for the Washington Capitals. And because of that, that the defenseman attacking a lot more, Zach Wierenski, as I mentioned in Columbus, along with uh, Seth Jones in Columbus. Now what's happened is the goalies have to be able to move. You can't be as predictable. So we've got a good balance between technical and athletic, and it's fun to watch. Do you think uh, they should put the red line back and get rid of the trapezoid? I know the great Scotty Bowman thinks they could put, they should put the red line back. He's been a big proponent of that. Uh, you know, my former teammate and the great Marty Brodeur isn't playing anymore. So there isn't anybody that handles the puck quite as well as he does. Although there's some guys that handle it really well. Jordan Bennington, Ben Bishop, when he's healthy, those guys are masters in handling the puck, but uh, I would be in favor of seeing the trapezoid gone. You know, I think the best part of it is, is being able to get in on the four check and our, our sport is such a speed game now with these speed merchants that you have, like Nate McKinnon, who looks like a V12 engine when you watch him fly. Uh, Connor McDavid is the fastest player I've ever seen, period, hands down. With respect to the great Pablo Burry, with respect to the great um, Paul Coffey, as an example, Connor McDavid is the fastest thing I've seen uh, on skates ever, in, you know, in, in hockey. So I, I would like to see the trapezoid be gone for that reason, because if you're able to dump the puck in, um, you know, I think it create a little bit more havoc on the forecheck, but all things being equal, that's a little tweak. I think our game's amazing. It's in an amazing place right now. And Ash, you've been around this league a long time. You've seen a lot of hockey in your day, and I know you have. You're smiling. One thing that's really cool is the fact that we're seeing so much more skill, and skill isn't only being limited to a Mario Lemieux or a Brian Leach or a mess. You know what I mean? It's not only your top-end players that are showing skill, but now you're seeing more skill up and down the lineup and coaches have a little more flexibility, sorry, a lot more flexibility in allowing their players to showcase their skill, which I think is great. Last question. What, what do you, sure. what do you see uh, heading into uh, 2000, 2021? When do you think we'll start? My thought is January at some, either, either early January, mid or late, but I think sometime in January, pardon me. And here's my big thought. You know, my big thought is, and I've thought this a long time, if I'm running an NHL team, especially now, especially given the pandemic, it's really important to have as much versatility in your lineup as possible. And I think if you look at the, at the Stanley Cup champs in Tampa, they're another example of that, right? So you're able to have, you know what you're getting out of Victor Hedman. You know what you're getting out of Kucherov. You know what you're getting out of your top guys, but even those top guys can do different things. There's a versatility to them. So Kucherov didn't only make plays from one part of the ice, right? Braden Point didn't only make plays from one part of the ice. Same thing for Victor Hedman. He could score anywhere in the offensive zone, but the same thing for their deaf players. So your deaf players come in, look at a guy like Kevin Shattenkirk came in and, and he looks reborn. He was comfortable. He was making plays. He felt good. He felt valued. Uh, he felt liberated after things didn't necessarily work out the way both him and the Rangers wanted them to in New York. You look at, again, I mentioned a guy like uh, Braden Colburn when he got into the lineup as a veteran guy. Luke Shen, who'd been in the league. I know him since he came to the league back in Toronto with the Leafs when he came in as an 18-year-old. You, you, know, you need versatile pieces. So that's one thing I'm looking for once this season starts is which team has the most versatility, not in terms of only their structure or their style of game, but in the way in which they let their players play. Because sometimes you got to go to the blender. And sometimes it's not working. Sometimes you got to take your top guy and put him on the fourth line with the fourth liners because the fourth line's going. Do you know what I mean? And look at the Islanders, I for know example. You. you know exactly what, like, hey, if I'm Barry Trotz, Barry Trotz feels comfortable putting out Sezikis, Martin, and Clutterbuck at any time. And that they might have been the Islanders' most consistent line if you really look at it, right? And same thing for Vegas with Ryan Reeves' line. So the versatility is something that I'm really looking forward to. And of course, I want to see, uh, I want to see Quentin Byfield out in LA. And, uh, and, and of course, Alexis, Alexi Lafreniere, excuse me, here in New York. I want to see those top picks and how they fare with their respective teams with the Kings and the Rangers, respectively. 
You think uh, the kid from L.A. is going to be uh, a stud? He looks like a stud from the videos yeah. I've seen. Yeah, Byfield has all the pieces. You know, a former NHL player, a guy I played against from the OHL back in our day, and Corey Stillman, uh, multiple NHL Stanley Cup champ. We played against each other in the league. Stiller's coaching. You know, his son plays for the Florida Panthers, Riley Stillman. And uh, Stiller coached Byfield up in Sudbury in the OHL back home. So uh, from everything that I've heard about Byfield and everything that I've watched and everything that I've seen, and especially for his size and his strength and his ability to skate and make plays, he could very well be an Andre Kopitar 2.0, which is exactly what the LA Kings are hoping he becomes uh, because Andre Kopitar has obviously been great and he's getting close to uh, 1,000 points in his career. And he's won two Stanley Cups. He's a world-class player and maybe a Hall of Famer already too. So that's what the Kings are hoping for in Byfield. And in the case of uh, Lafreniere, I think for the Rangers, because he's a winger, uh, they're hoping that he can become uh, a Patrick Kane Kucherov type, a winger that can also drive offense. So I'm looking forward to seeing those young guys. And just for a flyer, I'm looking forward to seeing the young Southpaw goalie, Askarov, uh, out of Russia, who went in the first round to Nashville Predators as well. Everybody I talked to over in Russia in the KHL, including the great Nikolai Abby Bulin, a uh, longtime NHL goalie and Stanley Cup champ, my former goalie partner, they rave about Askarov and his talent. So I'm looking forward to seeing uh, when he finally does come over to North America, how he looks. But there's a lot of different storylines, man. The King, the King also in Washington, Ash. That'll be interesting to watch. I'm pumped to see what that looks like. It will, it will. All right, anything you want to plug, uh, your Instagram page or anything else before I let you go? Yeah, hey, listen, I appreciate that. First of all, listen, you're one of the originals, man. <laughs> and, you know, you've been at the rinks, as I said, for years. You work the beat. I see you there. You're in there. And, and you've been... Hey, I saw you play. Yeah, exactly. And you've been doing such an amazing job for, for as long as you have. And I say that as the ultimate compliment because you're a pro's pro. You're in the room. You're in the rink. And as I always say, rink rats get the cheese. Something else that I'll say is, uh, is for a lot of you NHL fans, appreciate all of you that watch us on the NHL network and tune in and watch us on all the different NHL platforms. We appreciate you, NHL fans, not only here at Metro New York or here in the U.S., back home in Canada, but literally around the world. And then uh, I would also say to you fans, thanks for tuning in. Make sure you check me out on Twitter at Kevin Weeks and on Instagram at Kev Weeks on Instagram. Uh, I'm back to doing my Instagram lives and, and have a lot of great guests. I just had Nate Thompson on yesterday. You can go on my page and check it out. And I think the biggest thing too for us, Ash, right now, and I know you feel this way too, is just to continue to stay positive and stay united. Uh, we saw the, uh, you know, the election and we saw the results today. And no matter which way uh, you voted, no matter which way you didn't vote or who you like, who you don't like, uh, one thing we all like doing is being the United States of America. And it takes a lot of different faces, colors, shapes, ages, genders, religion, sexual orientation. We're all one team. So uh, let's continue to stay unified, continue to stay as the best country in the world and, and do that in a way where we continue to have dignity and class and, and allow for positive differences and, uh, and do it in a way that is best representative of who we are uh, that is the United States. I think that's really important. All right. I kept you enough time. Thank you for doing this. I, uh, I no worries, my man. Any time for you. Thank you so much. I like and thank you for being flexible too in your sched. Uh, next time down the road, I'd like to have you on again. Appreciate it. No worries, Thanks, Kevin. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for having me, Ash.